on, I'll actually be speaking on fintech and risk management, um, not fintech and governance. Um, I've been told I have 10 minutes and I have the dubious honor of speaking first, so that means I have to actually keep to time. So there'll be no banter, we're just going to go straight into the learning. Okay, I'll start counting, but don't start counting because my slides are not up. So I'll be talking today generally about the effects of bad risk management practices. Um, So I'll be talking about the effects of bad risk management practices first, and then hopefully if I have scared you enough to pay attention to the rest of what I have to say, I will then go into the categories of the risk in the fintech ecosystem, and then we'll talk about steps to um, good risk management practices, and then conclude hopefully within the 10 minutes. So going into... Okay. You guys have to add more time. Your clicker is not working. So, effect of bad risk management practices. The obvious ones: regulatory sanction. You could lose your license. Um, you could be fined. You could lose profits. Um, there's reputational damage. We're in social media era. I mean, everybody knows one viral scandal and that could be the end of it and i don't need to tell anybody here that customers they are fickle they will leave you quick because the competition is fierce so you could lose almost everything with reputational damage and then there's lots of shareholder funds which means that you don't just lose profit but you're at risk of losing capital as well and then of course the risk of lawsuits um, but it's not just that it could be a lot worse Right, this, this headline right here is a real headline. And if you look at the date, it's quite recent. Those that are familiar with this case would remember that these gentlemen were not accused of fraud. They didn't do anything. There was no sharp practice. What happened was that there was no fintech, um, I'm sorry, there was no risk management. There was no um, compliance risk management. There was no operational risk management. And that led to this. Now, there are people here that will say, well, I have nothing to do with America. My business is in Nigeria, and I'm not an American citizen. But guess what? Even the CBN admin sanctions regime contains imprisonment as one of the punishments for some of the breaches in that regulation. So guess what? If it be you. But that's why we are here today, to make sure that it is not you. Now, it might cost you money in the beginning, but guess what? It could save you hundreds of thousands of dollars going down the line. So, um, and then looking at AML CFT, I mean, I don't have to talk too much about this. Everybody is aware of AML, AML CFT regulations. The one thing I want to mention is that it's now strict compliance. You can't afford to go half measures. So there's strict compliance now when it comes to AML CFT. And you have to make sure that it's not even just local legislation. A lot of times stakeholders look for higher standards nowadays. So that's one thing to note. And then we're looking at KYC as well. Um, thank God for you, Verify. They've made KYC easy. And you, Verify, I'll collect my commission afterwards, right? They've made KYC easy. So what's your excuse? People will often say that FinTech is supposed to be nimble. It's supposed to be quick and easy. KYC slows the process down. But I will advise you, never, ever sacrifice your KYC on the altar of nimbleness. It will come back and it will bite you. And then um, also data protection and privacy. Many people have you know, familiar with NDPR, you're familiar with GDPR, you know that there are data protection requirements. Many people are also familiar with the fact that, yes, I can't just transfer data abroad, I can't store data abroad, there are restrictions. But there's less focus on things like data retention. How long do you keep customer data, even when they are no longer active? What's the state in which you keep the, uh, customer data? Do you anonymize it, for instance, or do you just leave it with all the personal identifying factors? And for how long? What's the regulation 
in the jurisdictions in which you are operating, and this is not just the juris jurisdiction in which you are incorporated, but the jurisdictions in which you operate, in which you collect data from. What's the regulation, for instance, in relation to retention and anonymization? This is why you need an expert. You need to be aware of these things, otherwise the risk might come and bite you. Um, and then things like big data. We have data, right? And we all know the value of big data. You can use it, you can mine it, you can get um, customer-focused information from this data. You can use it to customize your data, risk assessment and management. Oh, how wonderful. But in the jurisdictions in which you operate, are you allowed to use big, big data in this way? What are the implications? For instance, the EU is looking at big data controllers and is looking at them and saying, look, we need to put more focus on these guys in relation to antitrust issues in relation to market share. So when you are using big data in certain jurisdictions, you have to be aware of the implications of this big data that you are using. It's not just a case of, oh, I have data and I'm using it. And then we move to operational risk. So day-to-day um, -day operational risk is actually where a lot of people miss this thing. You have things like technology risk, yes. Cyber, cyber threat, cyber security, everybody is aware of that. But what about your licensing? Do you actually have the license that allows you to exploit, exploit the technology? Many people don't pay attention to things like assignment agreements, licensing agreements. You're using templates. You're getting your neighbor to look at it for you because your neighbor wears the wig and gown. Technology is the bedrock of fintech. And if the technology is the bedrock of fintech, you owe it to yourself and your company to ensure that that technology is actually right. You actually have the right authorizations and the right powers to exploit that, um, that technology. And then things like third party risk. Typically, this will come in form of customers or come in form of, uh, of partners. And this usually we would mitigate with KYC, we would mitigate contractually. Um, you very far spoken about KYC. Do you know your guy? Do you know this partner? Are they on the sanctions list? Will you be guilty by association? Those are things that you need to think about. And then contractually, what is your liability allocation? You're going into a partnership to deliver a product. What is the liability al allocation? What is the liability limitation? Those are important things to look at in contracts. And then that's more important when you look at things like robo-advisory, when you look at things like your smart contracts, like the fact that people are using outsourcing um, core banking to the cloud. Those kind of things be become more important when you then think of the fact that there are multi-jurisdictional components in these things. And so it's important to really understand, for instance, the statutory liability allocation framework when you are going into this thing so that you don't end up carrying the bag of risk. And then, of course, enforcement. Many of us use smart contracts. The customers love it. Click a button and it's done. But smart contracts are actually not enforce enforceable in every jurisdiction. And this is something that one should consider. And then intellectual property. Is it registered? Do you have your appropriate protection language? And then my favorite one, corporate organizational risk. And this is something that applies to a lot of startups. Um, in a rush to just move forward, develop, and start and get into the market, many people feel to address strategic risks at inception. So do you have the right corporate structure? Simple things like do you have a shareholders agreement? Do you have director contracts? Are your supply chain agreements in place? It's quite disheartening the number of fintechs that we see that are stuck and cannot scale because of disputes that could have been avoided by a very simple contract. And then strategic risk. I mean, that's the more quiet one, the, the, the slow poison. Strategic risk essentially involves future risk management by contingency planning. So what is your business continuity plan, for instance? And I've just set out here, I mean, I've spoken about mitigation as I've spoken, right? But I've set out here some of the other mitigation strategies. So your business continuity plan, you need forward thinking structuring, you need to have inbuilt flexibility in your structuring. Of course, hire an expert, hire a lawyer. Subscribe to regulatory watch services. Change control processes are very important. Many people don't pay attention to them. And then, of course, your regulatory obligations must be inbuilt into your contracts. Don't separate your contracts from regulatory framework, right? It, it's one and all. And then, of course, operational risk. You need to ensure that um, you have good risk management software or a good risk manager at the, re a manager at the very least. And then engage in real-time suspicious activity monitoring. I mean, we had a client come to us and, of course, the partner refused to take bare liability because 
what should have been reported six months ago was only just being discovered down the line. And they had the obligation to monitor and to report. So you can avoid massive fraud if you just monitor and report. And then, of course, corporate governance, which um, Joseph will speak about. And then um, liability insurance. It, professional liability insurance is important. I mean, that's something that many people don't think about. Um, and then, of course, I have set out some of the applicable laws in Nigeria. There are many of them, and there are many that are not in Nigeria, but are also applicable. Um, you can't see them. They are very tiny. But don't worry, your lawyers know them. This is another reason why you need a lawyer, because otherwise you have to think about all of these laws. Um, okay, so to conclude, I think I'm one minute over. Um, I've said that risk management framework requires implementing structured policies. That's the first step. You have to articulate your risk appetite. You have to establish strong internal controls. Honestly, risk management starts it's from in, inside. It starts from your the bot like Aaron's, how do they say it in the Bible? From the oil from Aaron's beard, it flows down. So it starts from the board. It starts from senior management. They set the tone, and then it flows down. And then, of course, you must ensure that you have risk assessments and you have adequate oversight. Board oversight of risk management is key. If you don't have a risk management committee and things don't come to the board, then you are you are setting yourself up for failure in the future. And then the regulators are here, so I'll say this. Regulators also have a role to play. Fintech risk will ultimately become systemic risk because of the role that fintechs have started to play in the financial system. And so regulators also have a duty to reconstruct their own systematic financial risk prevention and control methods. And the only way they can do this is to understand the fintechs. How do you do this? We look at things like um, sandboxes. So the regulators also have a duty to ensure that they are helping to ensure there's proper risk management in fintech. Thank you very much. I wasn't really over time.